Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, Year 7. Welcome to Lesson 5 for Design Technology. We have finished design process topics, so we're now on to Topic 2, which is electronics. So before we begin, just make sure your workspace is nice, clean, and tidy, and free of any distractions. And today's lesson, you're going to need different colour pens to help you make notes, uh, and some paper just to actually make the notes on. As always, you can print the lesson page out if you can. Right, the lesson allows you to pause your screen to complete work. Once you're finished, obviously then carry on and click play. So as always, let's start with the do now. I said you have about four minutes on this one, so give yourself a timer. Uh, and whilst they're on, just pause. Okay, so if you haven't already and you haven't quite finished, just pause the video now while you complete it, and we're about to move on. Okay, there's all the answers. I'm not going to run through them because I'm again keen to try and keep the video nice and short. But pause the video, make notes of those answers, and just give yourself all the marks that you need. Okay, so to today, the whole learning outcome is to develop a broad understanding of working with electronics and be able to describe an open and closed loop electronic system. Now, this is something that none of you have done so far in year seven, so this is completely new. So, we'll spend a bit of time going over these. So what is electronics? Um, electronics are increasingly used in products around the home to automate simple jobs in a bid to make our lives easier. They're also designed to process more power. So for example, electronics on your games consoles, 20, 30 years ago, they were very, very basic, could do very simple graphics. Now the electronics inside them are much more powerful, which can give a much more realistic image. When you're on your computer, your computer can process a lot more data Okay, much faster all that's down to electronics and also be able to describe an open and closed loop electronic system these are the main two electronic systems that are used and they're quite simple to differentiate between the two an open system is a very simple basic system that can simply send a signal to do something for example like turning on a light flick the switch light comes on and that's it a closed loop system is a bit more intelligent and this could be something like a light sensitive a sensitive light like a security light so if someone comes up to the house and it's dark the light will come on what that's using is using information that's available like how much how light is outside those security lights don't come out on in the daytime because it's picking up that signal also something like a thermostat in a house that controls your heater if you've got a very basic heater system you turn the heater on and until you turn it off it just blasts out the heat if you've got a more intelligent system it's constantly monitoring the temperature in the house and what that does is monitors the temperature. When it gets to a certain temperature, it will turn off the heat. Okay, so again, there's just a little bit of an explanation if you want to make those notes. And again, if you need to pause the video, just pause the video whilst you make those notes. Okay, so when you work with electronics, we've got all those, in, all those um, different tools and devices, really, that are used when working with electronics. So take a bit of time to read through them. I'll run through them as well. So soldering iron and sponge. Basically what you've got on a soldering iron, you have the tip of the soldering iron, which is the metal part here that heats up. And what that does, it melts the solder, which is the next part. Okay, and what the solder does is joins, it melts, turns into a liquid, flows over the electronics uh, components, and then permanently joins them together. You're gonna to see a video on the next slide, which will talk about this. Okay, but, so it's important just to think about these when you're watching it. Side cutters simply used to cut components or wire, and again you'll see that in the video. And wire strippers, which are used to remove the plastic outer layer on wire to allow the solder to actually connect to it, because the solder won't melt and won't fix to the plastic. A PCB track cleaner, which you won't see in the video, what this does is just cleans things up just to remove any oxide deposits away from the, the circuit, basically to allow the, the solder to stick. Fume extractor, which just is a giant hoover full of fumes, and it sucks all those fumes away to stop you inhaling them in your lungs. Helping hands tool, so what you can see on here is a couple of little crocodile clips, they're called, and what you can use those for is just to hold components, and then it's got a magnifying glass in the middle, so you can really see what you're doing on really small little parts. And then you've got a desolder pump, also known as a solder sucker, or tape, and what that's used for is if you put a bit too much solder in the wrong place, or a bit too much solder on in the first place, you can use that just to suck away. It's like a syringe, um, but obviously all metal bodied so it doesn't melt. So you're now going to watch the video 
of how to solder the LED that you're going to use in your low voltage lamp and see if you can see where different tools and equipment are used and where it might have been popped better if, if certain tools were there. Okay, so we'll just run through that video. This video is going to show you how to wire up your 1 watt star LED using a USB power cable and a 10 ohm resistor. You can tell it's a 10 ohm resistor because it has a brown, black and black stripe. So first thing we need to do is chop off this end off of our power cable using the cutters. Just chop nice and close to the end and chop that away. We don't need that, that can now go in the scrap pile. Next job is to strip this cable. Okay, now you might need a few goes at this. But what we need to do is, using the cutters, grip about three centimetres down, okay, just sort of gently cut, and then get a good grip of the cable and just pull it away, okay, to release this outer cable. You'll either have a red and a grey or a red and a blue. Okay, so we're not right back. Now what we need to do is strip about a centimetre off each one of these. Okay, so we do that by just pinching and again pulling it away. If we cut all the way through, you've got enough to just have another go, just to try a second time. Again, about a centimetre off this one as well. Okay. Next thing we need to do is just give these a really good twist to create, just sort of try and get rid of all the individual strands, create one strong piece of wire. Okay, do the same on the red one. Okay, keep twisting it until you get a nice strong piece. Okay, now this stage is when you need to pass your cable through the hole that you've already cut in your lamp. Okay, so just pinch the two bits together, try not to undo the good work that you've just done, poke it through, go from the outside to the inside. Okay, and then give them a good pull through and give the, bring the whole cable through until the USB cable is pretty much there. Okay, now we're only going to work now on this end. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is connect the red to the resistor. So what we do on the resistor, we just fold one end back in half, okay, to create that little loop. What we need to do then with the red cable is put the red cable through and just create a little loop, like so. I'll just show you that one again. So just poke the red one through, okay, and just sort of pull back to create that loop is quite fiddly as you can see but we create basically two loops then pinch one end and then just give it a twist by twisting and spinning the resistor to create a nice joint here okay we need to solder that up so we use a small bit of solder and solder wire and our soldering iron make sure the tip of your soldering iron is nice and shiny and best way to do this is actually put the soldering iron onto, so hold the wire still with one finger here, put the soldering iron right on the joint where you want to solder, okay, release and then feed the solder in for about two or three seconds, okay, now if you keep that on then what you need to do is just put your finger onto the wire and just gently move the soldering iron away, okay, and you can see, just let this cool, this will still be hot for about 30 seconds, so just leave that to cool down and it will solidify and give you a really good solid joint. Okay, as you can see now there, you've got a really good joint. On the other end of the resistor, we need to trim this down so there's only about a centimetre of wire after. So we just cut that off like so there. Okay, and we're going to do the same with our end of our black or grey or blue wire, which is our negative. Just chop that off as well so there's only about a centimetre of wire here. Now, on our resistor, marked up with a negative and a positive. Okay, now the one with the resistor on is going to go to the positive, so we're going to do that one first. Okay, so just get your wire sort of into a nice sort of arranged order. Quite fiddly. Put the end of the resistor on. And this is where you need to just clamp down that wire and put your resistor uh, soldering iron on top to hold it in place. Take your, just move it into the middle of the picture. Okay, so, resistor on, clamp it down in place using the soldering iron, and then just feed in some solder. Okay, 
then gripping it with your fingers, make sure you're gripping up here, and just hold it in place while that actually sets. Okay, give the soldering iron a clean. Okay, it'll set after a few seconds. Okay, that's now set in place. Then what we can do is sort of bend it around slightly and move the negative or the black or the grey wire onto the minus. Again, pinch it down with the soldering iron. Give the soldering iron a clean if you need to. Pinch it in place. And get your solder and feed solder in. Okay, and again, hold it in place, being careful to keep your fingers away from that solder and it will get hot. Okay, that's now all fixed in place. Okay, and what you can do now is pull the cable through. Okay, to put your USB light inside your lamp. Okay, that's the end of the video. Okay, so next one then is circuit boards. So circuit boards is this picture you can see here, the green picture. They used to make circuits which perform particular tasks, and the best way to keep these components connected is use a PCB, also known as a printed circuit board. So what you've got on the printed circuit board is all these little tracks that you can see, which is sort of the light green areas. They're effectively small pieces of wire which transfer electricity or signals in between different components. You find PCBs in all different electronic products. One of the main reasons they're used to enable lots of components to be put together in a very small space. And that improvement in PCB technology is one of the big reasons that your mobile phone can do what it can do now. Okay, it can still be nice and small. So you can see a comparison here of an old sort of Nokia brick is what they were commonly referred as. And an iPhone 11. Okay, Nokia brick, very big, battery lasted a very short amount of time and all it could actually do is make calls. iPhone 11, it could do a multitude of things. Battery lasted a good sort of day, pushing on to two days. But you can do a huge amount of things with them. Gaming, high resolution gaming, streaming, yeah, phone calls, text messages, internet, you name it. Pretty much a smartphone can do it. And that's all down to sort of the improvement in electronics. Next thing we want to look at is resistors. So one of the common type of electronic component is the resistor. And you can see a picture of the resistor down here. Now it doesn't actually sort of explain how big they are, but actually a resistor is no bigger than sort of your little fingernail okay in terms of this central bit which is colored they're very very small okay and they're actually some of the bigger ones on the top picture on the pcb some of the resistors are some of these tiny little ones down sort of at the bottom okay so they can be miniaturized when they're going on the pcb and what resistor does it just restricts flow of electricity okay and what that does is allows components within a circuit to be protected because if you just pump all the electricity that's coming into the circuit through a certain component you might blow the component or overheat it which would then cause it to blow okay so resistors play a really important but they just slow down that electricity okay it's like squeezing a hose so when you're firing water through a high pressured hose or a hose like in your back garden if you squeeze that hose what that does is slows down the water now for example if you're spraying that hose let's just say towards a bunch of flowers high pressure okay without squeezing it you're going to blast all heads off the flowers and they're going to be destroyed if you squeeze the hose it restricts that electricity and then protects the flowers so imagine those flowers are your device at the end of it like a light bulb okay the resistors help to protect that Okay, so moving on to electronic systems. A system is a collection of parts that performs a function. A system's diagram is a representation of how a system will work. Okay, so generally what you have is an input, a process, and an output. Okay, and very simply, inputs can be a switch or a sensor. Okay, that literally just picks up a signal. Okay, other common inputs are things like you've got here. Uh, so things like microphones, mice, a keyboard, a touchscreen monitor. Okay, all of those things are input devices which are going to pick up a signal. The process or the processor is the brain of the system, okay, which considers the inputs and then decides what to do. So common processes include comparators, latches, things called logic gates, counters, timers, pulse generators, 555 chips, PIC controllers and microcontrollers. All of those things you'll learn about a bit more detail in future lessons. 
but basically they're the different things that pick up and process the input signal and convert it into an output. Now, a typical output could be a flashing light, buzzer or a speaker, or any of those sort of devices there. You think about when you print something on your computer. Yeah, you press the keyboard or the mouse to print, that's the input. The computer then processes it because it's the processor in the brain of the computer, and then it sends it out into ink printed on the paper, okay, which would then be the output. The same as your TV. Your TV input might be the remote control. Your processor is sort of the brain that's inside the TV. The output is both the sound and the video. Okay, now they're sort of three independent uh, input output, the input process output devices. Okay, these things do it all in one. Okay, so the input for both of these is you talking to it, it monitors your voice. The processor is built inside, and that will actually sort of take the input and decide what to do with it. The output could either be the speaker, it could be that the output is Alexa's and Google Home can control lights in your house. It can turn heating on and off. Okay, so those are output signals that these devices can send. So back to what we just start, started with, an open loop and closed loop systems. So let's have a read through these. So open loop systems are set up to achieve desired results, but there's no way of checking if those results have been achieved. So an old fashioned heating system might be you switch on your heating, like we discussed earlier, your boiler turns on, it heats up the hot water or the radiators, okay, and that's it. Okay, so the inputs, the switch, the process is the, the boiler and the controls within the boiler, and the outputs and the radiator. Okay, but it's going to stay on all the time. So if all of a sudden it starts to get warm outside, your heating is going to stay on pumping that heating out. A closed loop system is able to correct in order to meet target results. So you're going to use sensors. So in a heating system, what you might have is you might set a thermometer or a thermostat rather to a certain temperature, let's say 20 degrees, which is a typical sort of comfortable household. You turn your heating on, you can turn it on to full blast, but as soon as it gets to 20 degrees, your heating will switch off. So automatically then what that's going to do, it'll switch off. If all of a sudden this heating starts to drop down a little bit in temperature, it'll turn back on Okay, and it's a loop system, okay, and it will keep going up and down. That's going to save you money and obviously be more energy efficient and be better for the environment. Okay, just pause the video if you want to make a couple more notes on what I've said there. Okay, if you want to go back and just rewind it and just play it again, feel free. So we're on to our tasks now, which we're getting towards the end of the lesson. So we've got our knowledge application questions. I'm just going to give you four or five minutes to run through those. Okay, you're probably going to want to pause the video. Okay, we're not just going to pause on this slide for five minutes. So pause the video and when you're ready, just carry it on. Okay, and there's your answers. So I'm not going to read through all these. They're there for you to look at and read, make notes. Okay, but as always, on the right hand side, redo. If you want to have another go, use the feedback. Add, add some more depth or some more detail to the answers that you've got. If you've made any mistakes, just go through and correct them. Okay, and again, pause the video while you act, add anything based on that feedback. Okay, that concludes today's lesson. So as always, uh, there's a tiny URL to go to. So www.tinyurl.com forward slash YCFBJSYA. Again, type it into the address bar. You can't Google search it, it won't come up. Or alternatively, use the QR code, scan it with your camera or the QR code reader app. And it will take you directly to this week's quiz. Thanks for listening, Year 7, and I will see you again next week.